All right, it is 12 p.m., so let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is the last of three webinars we hosted this fall. Keep an eye out for the announcement of our spring series early next year. And if you would like to be kept in the know and aren't already subscribed to our monthly science and conservation newsletter, Go Botanical, you can sign up on our website. Uh, that's where we make a lot of these announcements as well as other events uh, that happen virtually and in person. I'll be dropping the link uh, in the chat for that shortly and also a link to our webinar series page where you can view recordings from past webinars. This webinar is being recorded. We'll be sending the recording out to you sometime in the next few days. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature or the Q&A feature. We will be holding a general Q&A at the end where I'll be asking uh, any questions that you drop in to our panelists. We'll try to get to all of your questions, but if we don't, please feel free to follow up with me via email, which I will drop into the chat in a moment as well. Uh, we're hosting today's session from lots of different places, uh, but mostly from our Botanical Research Center here on Kauai. And I have with me Dr. Nina Ronsted, our Director of Science and Conservation, who will now tell you a little bit about today's session. Thanks, Amanda, and welcome to all of you, and thanks for joining us today. We have created this series of webinars to invite you behind the scenes to meet all the people who are leading our science and conservation work. An interview is dedicated to understand and preserve tropical flora and ecosystems from our base here in Hawaii. And Hawaii has a really unique flora to take care of with more than 1360 native plants, most of them only found on these islands. And today is a special end of the year event, so we're really excited to share some of our important conservation highlights from 2022, ranging from exceptional discoveries in the field, uncovering the secret life of plants to new technologies, which all provide better and new opportunities for plant conservation. You may already have heard about how a drone program is helping us to discover rare and endangered plants on inaccessible cliff habitats in Hawaii. So first off, our drone program manager, Ben Nyberg, will be telling us about a new breakthrough this year. Let the celebrations begin. Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, so um, I've given a few webinars before about our drone program. Um, and this one is gonna be updated um, with sort of the recent developments that we've been working on. But before I get into that, I wanted to just start with a little bit of background about how we came to using drones uh, for our plant conservation. Um, so as men uh, Nina mentioned earlier, um, Hawaii is a really special place for plants. And uh, Kauai specifically uh, has 250 single island endemics. So um, the most diverse um, in that respect, um, of all the islands, and um, we also have a lot of rarity. 90 of those species are, are just down to fewer than 50 individuals. Um, so it makes it really important to uh, work as fast as we can. And these are some of the areas we work. Um, you know, we're, we're covering terrain that's very dry to very wet, coastal and inland. Um, and you can see, from, from these photos, just um, how steep and treacherous some of the terrain is. Um, so that's what sort of sparked the idea of using drones. And in 2017, we started a drone program uh, specifically for looking at uh, rare and remote populations of, of plants. Almost immediately, um, we started to, to have some exciting finds. Uh, this is Limahuli Valley, one of the first places that we started surveying. And here's Euphorbia elenorii and Plantago princeps variety anomala. Um, these plants hadn't been documented on this side of the island before. So, um, you know, it was kind of a, a, a exciting time when we were starting out with the drone program to be finding these plants in places we weren't expecting them. Um, so finding them was kind of the first step. And after that, we needed to get to them to make collections. And here's some of our collaborators, Adam Williams with the state of Hawaii and Scott Heinzman with the Plant Extinction Prevention Program. 
Um, and they're rappelling down to, to collect from those plants that we found by drone. Um, there's still limitations in this method. Uh, you need to be able to get to the top of the cliff uh, to tie in and go down to the plants. And also you're limited by the amount of rope that you can bring with you. Um, it still leaves a lot of area that uh, is untouchable by rope. So um, we came up with a new tool called the Mamba. And this is a drone cutting mechanism that they can go in and make plant collections. Uh, it's actually two independent drones working together. Um, the one on top is lifting and the one below is the, um, the sampler. And here's a close up of that lower part. Um, it has its own propellers and camera. The actual cutting mechanism is a rotating saw and there's uh, two sets of grippers that, that kind of grab the plant and make sure that it's secure for the flight home. Um, we're working with our Out Outreach Robotics. They're based in Quebec and they've been a great partner um, on this project doing all the robotics development. Um, there's two sets of controllers and two pilots that, that actually make the collections. Um, in addition to that, we have another spotter usually that, that helps give situational awareness to the team. Um, and here's an example of the cutting mechanism going in and, and making a, a collection. Uh, this is Wilksia hobdii. And um, as you can see here, it kind of comes up from underneath and closes the grasping mechanism and then makes the cut and moves away from the cliff. Um, here is the that exact uh, collection. We're able to operate about a mile away from our, our vantage point, and that really uh, opens such a, a wide range of areas that we can cover in one day. So uh, makes makes it very efficient for, for making a lot of plant collections. Uh, so now back to that Plantago Princeps that I mentioned earlier. This is the location where we had originally found it um, in 2017. And you know, at that point we thought, well, it's great that we know it's there, but there's no way we're ever going to be able to get up there. And you know, fast forward five years, and now we have a new tool that is actually allowing us to, to go up there and make collections. Here's the mamba approaching that, that exact area. And here is the collection of Plantago princeps that it was able to get. Um, Ryan, who is the nursery manager and will be speaking after me, um, will give a little more detail on what happens once the plants get down to the nursery. But I just wanted to show from finding it to collecting it, um, that part of the process that we're using drones for. Here's another area in the center of Kauai, um, one of the wettest places on earth. These cliffs are over 3000 feet <clears throat> and they're home to a species that only occurs on these cliffs. And that species is called Lysimachia aniki. Here's a close up of the plant. <clears throat> um, the, the drone goes in and even if the top grasper doesn't grab it, the, the bottom cutting mechanism also stays closed and can uh, retain the, the plant material. And we're, we're um, really excited about this because previous to this, all our collections were made when pieces broke off from the cliffs and fell to the base of the cliff. And, you know, it was kind of opportunistic in, in how we could get to them. Um, here's uh, the mamba dropping the plant material off into a collector's hand, and it can go right back up and make two to three collections in one set of batteries. Uh, and then here it is uh, once it gets into our hands. And it's just uh, really exciting that we have these new tools. This is probably one of the most intact pieces of the plant that we've seen. And, um, you know, we're getting these fresh cuttings that can go straight to the nursery. So, um, you know, again, we're, we're working in extremely rough terrain and, you know, technology is just changing the way and the speed that we're doing the work. So um, thank you for tuning in, uh, mahalo. And uh, we'll have some time for the questions at the end. Thank you so much, Ben.
And now we get to hear about what happened to those cuttings from our nursery manager, Ryan Campbell. So go ahead and take it away, Ryan. You're muted, Ryan. Okay, I think I got it now. <laughs> Sorry about yes. that. We can hear you. You're good okay. to go. I work at NTVG's uh, conservation nursery on the main campus here between McBride and Allerton Garden. And we work primarily with threatened and endangered plants and some displayed plants for the garden. Um, but a big part of our purpose is to work with these uh, plants for conservation and restoration. And so I'm gonna share more success about the cuttings that have come down from the uh, drone program. All right, so one of the most exciting things I think about the drone program is how quick we can get the plants down to the nursery and get them um, processed for propagation. So Ben and the drone team will go up and drive up to a location or helicopter in, set up the drone, go into those cliffs and bring back the cuttings to the, their location, drive straight down the mountain and bring them to the nursery that afternoon where we can process them. And the next day they can drive up, get a new collection and bring them back down to the nursery. So it's just very fast. There's minimal handling. Um, they're not hiking around with them in a backpack. and just a really good quality, which I think is a big contributor to the success. So this first plant that I'm gonna talk about is Lysomachia hillebrandii or Colocolo kulahidi. And it's not as rare as the others I'm gonna talk about in this presentation, but it's important to mention because um, Lysomachia are known to be hard to propagate from cuttings. So um, we kind of played around with the environment with this one. We changed the watering regime. So they weren't getting as much direct water on the leaves. Um, instead, they were kept in the mist house where the water does go off all the time, like every 30 minutes or so. But um, that keeps the humidity up, which decreases transpiration and uh, the lack of water on the leaves and the potting media actually helps cut down the fungal growth and algae that kind of limit us at times with some of these really rare things. So that was a good success to get this one to take. The next plant here is Lysomachia aniki, which is the one that Ben was showing, one of the ones that Ben was showing in his presentation. And this one was named um, after Hurricane Aniki when fragments had fallen off the cliff and one of our botanists found it or, um, yeah. And so we've tried to grow it from cuttings uh, before from these different fragments, but we really don't know how long those fragments were sitting down at the bottom of the cliff. Um, so this is a, an opportunity to get them very fresh and bring them straight back and get them propagated. Um, so again, we tried the same methods that we used on the Hillebrandii and that worked for this species as well. This one is the Cadre St. Johnii and it grows on the steep cliffs like the Lysomachia, just like you see on that picture on the right, not very accessible for people to get to. So uh, Ben's team was able to get a cutting that had some seed with it on this one and we grew this plant from seed in the nursery. That is exciting too, another opportunity. Uh, this next plant, Euphorbia Eleanorii, um, this is an honorable mention because we were able to get it successfully rooted. Um, however, it did not survive all the way to making a new propagule. So um, we do have some confidence that we can try this one again in the future and probably have some success trying some different methods. So not a total loss. We are learning from these things too. And then finally, uh, Plantago Princeps variety anomala, that one that he brought down from uh, the spire above Lima Huli Garden there, otherwise known as Laukahi Kulahivi. This one, um, we tried a new propagation method altogether. First, we had noticed it was heat sensitive. So we tried growing it in the uh, climate controlled fern lab we have down here, which you're gonna hear from Mike Demota here shortly, more about the fern lab. 
Uh, but this one, I also used some, some knowledge from when I uh, had an aquaponics vegetable farm. And that was that if, if I suspended plants above a water reservoir, it seemed to encourage the growth of roots to get to that water. So I wanted to try that here um, as we had not heard of any success growing these plants from cuttings before. So just kind of trying some new methods out. And uh, in June, we got our first roots. It was about two and a half months or so. Um, and I've since seen research papers that say, yeah, that that is a method that seems to work. Plants want to send roots in the direction of water. So going down seemed logical. <laughs> seemed like a good place for them to go. So anyway, in uh, October, we got our first flower stock that popped out of this guy. And then now we have actually four flower stocks. We just had a fourth one emerge a couple of days ago. And it has a really nice amount of pollen and what looks to be receptive female parts. So we're really hoping that we'll get some seed and be able to do a population increase with these. So yeah, just a big thank you for, um, especially to Haley, who is our horticulturalist in the nursery. She does a lot of creative work with making micro environments in here by adjusting the shade and the water and the potting media and even other conditions to try to cement our success and help them transition from these tender cuttings into actual thriving plants. So also big thanks to Ben and the drone team for the amazing cuttings they're able to retrieve with this technology, it's amazing. And then thank you to everyone who supports NTBG and the amazing work that they do. And it really takes a village to be successful with these complex projects. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's really great to kind of get an update on what's happening with those cuttings in real time. So like Ryan mentioned, that Plantago is it growing in the uh, Fern Lab right now. And we have Mike Demoda up next, who's gonna tell you more about some exciting new things that are happening there. So go ahead and take it away, Mike. All right, thank you. Um, so as an extension of our nursery operations and all the restoration projects that, that NTBG has been involved with, since back as far back as 2005, when I first started, um, one of the things that we discussed in those days, uh, 2006 or so, was uh, at, at uh, Limuholi and other restoration sites that we've been working in. Um, we were primarily growing shrubs and trees, and uh, uh, you know anybody who's been into native ecosystems will tell you uh, that there are plenty of ferns and, and epiphytes that grow on the branches and, and, and stalks of the of the trees and shrubs that we were kind of missing in some of our restoration projects. So we were very interested at that point to, to be able to grow ferns. Um, sorry. So uh, a couple of reasons for, for wanting to grow ferns, other than you know them being an integral part of the ecosystem, there's also a lot of cultural significance. Uh, many fern species are kinolao or physical manifestations of the of various gods or deities from the Hawaiian uh, religion, the old religion, including um, uh, palapalai, which is a fairly common uh, indigenous species that is actually the uh, uh, plant form of the hula god uh, Laka. Uh, this fern, uh, the picture of this fern, Pala uh, Maradia douglasii, is actually an important fern used uh, or formerly used in ceremony during uh, the Makahiki festival, which is actually going on right now. This is the season of Makahiki. This fern was sacred to the god Lono. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. So um, uh, yeah, so Limihuli Garden, uh, there's a, a couple, of big, couple of big restoration sites there in the valley and ferns uh, are kind of noticeably missing, save for Hapu or the uh, tree fern that we're all relatively familiar with. Uh, they are scattered throughout the valley, but ferns are generally missing throughout. And yet when you go into habitat, particularly wet habitat up in Kokei, uh, this is more what you tend to see, especially in pristine areas where there's little or no disturbance from feral pigs. Uh, this fern, uh, the fern pictured here is called Hoi a Maui, which literally means Maui's paddle. Hoi is a canoe paddle, and uh, this is Maui's paddle. And uh, what, when you get into an area that's like this, that is 
uh, wall to wall uh, mosses and ferns is really exciting to see. Uh, as some of the ferns, as I mentioned, were culturally important. Palapalai to the left is a very important lay fern and the manifestation of the goddess Laka. Uh, the fern on the right is the native Lawa'e, also known as Peahi. Uh, it is uh, quite rare on all the islands. Uh, the five-lobed form that's pictured here is, is a uh, Kauai uh, endemic subspecies. And then, of course, there's uh, a Ma'u ferns, which, you know, if you go to the volcano on the Big Island, these are one of the first tree ferns to for, start growing in lava flows. But here on Kauai, I've seen these growing, you know, just above the salt water line along the windward coast uh, up by Princeville. So they were way more common at one time. Uh, the adaptation of some of our fern species, though, is pretty amazing. This is an image on the left here of the crater of Waialeale looking down from the very top from the summit. And the Amau ferns, if you look carefully, you'll see Amau ferns all along these walls. This is a species, Sadlera squarosa, that is adapted to these wet cliff faces. And you generally only find them on, on CP walls, uh, stream banks, and on these wet cliff faces. And uh, ferns have very uh, dense uh, root mass, uh, masses of roots that really hold um, the soil in place. But ferns are also adapted to some very, very dry environments. This is a picture of Lehua Island. Lehua, uh, if you don't know, is an uh, offshore islet. It is unoccupied. It's a very important bird sanctuary. And that little fern on the right is a, is a species that's found near the coast in very, very dry habitat. Um, Doryopteris decor there, uh, well adapted to the dry habitat because once the moisture dries out, the fern then goes dormant. So they're still out there. It's kind of exciting when, we, when I first saw them out there the first time I went out to Lehua. So this is a graphic on uh, just a quick thing on, on uh, pr producing ferns from spores. Now, we were producing ferns using vegetative uh, techniques, uh, rhizome divisions and so forth. But ideally, you want to grow things from, from seeds, for in the case of plants, or from spores in the case of ferns, because you, you tend to capture a, a genetic diversity that you don't get when you're doing them from divisions or from cuttings, which basically is clonal, clonal reproduction. And so even though ferns occur in the wild uh, and grow naturally on their own, in cultivation, it's a little bit trickier. And there's, there are techniques that you need to master, uh, the amount of light that the spores get and, and uh, keeping them well weeded and moist enough, uh, but not so moist that they start growing algaes and fungi, fungi and, so, and so forth. So um, over the years, uh, we've been growing ferns in cultivation. And Dr. Ruth Agurayuha uh, is a research associate with NTBG. Uh, was coming to Hawaii on her own from Estonia uh, and, and studying Hawaiian ferns. And the, um, she basically got her PhD on a, on a genus of ferns that uh, at the time was, was known as Esplinium dial pallidum. And uh, this is a Kauai endemic. There were actually only a handful of these plants left on the entire island in dry forest on the northwest side. And nothing really was known about their growth habits and, and all that. So Ruth... Uh, took many years, I, I can't even tell you, she's been working on this species for uh, like two decades, but it took many years for her to figure it out. So I go back to this image to show you the little tubs on the right side. Uh, we had a, a sort of a temporary fern lab set up in what we call the Acacia Lab, which is at our administrative offices. And we had racks and racks of these things that were in support of Ruth's research on fern propagation. And although her focus was primarily on Esplinium dial pallidum, uh, we, we talked and um, we mentioned that you know we really wanted to start growing ferns in larger numbers for restoration work out at Limuhuli Garden, and she was happy to do that. So we had bought additional racks and, and growing lights, and uh, we kind of set it up in, in the Acacia Lab. And for a couple of years, we were able to do it. Now, so the groundbreaking research for this was uh, she discovered that you can't just sow the spores of one plant and get results. Generally, if you sow the spores for this particular species, uh, they, they, they sprout and they become what looks like moss or gametophytes, and then they don't develop any further. And so after a couple of years of trial and error, she ended up mixing spores from two different collections, and then she saw progress. The, the gametophytes began to develop, uh, and eventually she got her first sporophytes. The picture on the left are very young sporophytes that were transplanted out. Now, the other esplenium, uh, well, it was uh, Doryopteris and, and all before, was esplenium dialmanii. Um, this was a really rare, I remember going to see the one plant that was known to exist on the entire island. 
And uh, we, I had gone with Ruth and other uh, researchers there at NTBG, and eventually that plant did die. However, one of the NTBG field botanists, Ken Wood, rediscovered a small population of them uh, the other side of Waimea Canyon. And so spores were collected, uh, handed off to Ruth, and uh, uh, Ruth took the spores and planted them in her lab in Estonia and produced hundreds of plants from those spores. And so uh, those plants uh, were then sent back to Hawaii. And uh, the picture I just showed you is actually from one of the plants that she shipped back from Estonia that was outplanted in the original range uh, of the plant that died. So here's Ruth, and at the time was one of our interns um, working in our fern lab. Uh, but you know, over the years, uh, because it was it uh, it was just sort of a side project. Our fern lab was never um, fully staffed. Ruth would come for three months out of the year. We would uh, get interns through the uh, uh, members through the Kupu program, or we would recruit interns in house, and we would have interns learn every year through every intern cycle, how to do the work that Ruth took decades practically to learn how to do. So it was really frustrating uh, until the last couple of years, NTBG uh, under the leadership of our CEO, Janet Mayfield, committed to the Fern Lab. We made it a primary uh, function. We did fundraising, targeted fundraising for it. And I'm happy to say that we now have a full-time Fern Lab technician, Emily Cezate, and um, our field botanists are excited because now they bring in fresh spores uh, um, as they go to the fern lab and we work on it, um, get them propagated and are, are documenting the protocols that are necessary to grow ferns from spores. I have this picture up because this is a really unusual uh, Kauai subspecies, endemic subspecies for Kauai, Dryopteris cornalis variety potosaurus. And the way the spores are presented, the sori here is really pretty remarkable and kind of shows art in nature because it's really a beautiful thing to look at. Um, one of the projects that we did as well, though, was uh, go into our herbarium because we have a lot of fern uh, 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 specimens stored in the herbarium, lots of uh, voucher specimens. And we wondered, uh, will, would spores withstand the vouchering process? So you collect the fern in the wild, you know, the leaf blade, and you press it, bring it in, put it in the dryer, uh, and create an herbarium specimen from that. And uh, and so we've had uh, fern collections in our burn that, that date back many, many years. And we actually went back and uh, uh, our interns at the time, Emily was an intern, went back and recovered spores from, from a number of herbarium sheets. And even after a couple of decades, some of those spores did germinate. So our, our hope in the future, uh, as we improve, increase our capacity in the fern lab, is to be able to go back and look at some of the other older herbarium sheets and possibly pull spores off of sheets that might be representing species that could be really rare or even extinct in the wild and maybe recover those species from what's in our herbarium. So uh, that's really exciting for us. And uh, uh, again, you know, once we increase our capacity, we'll definitely be able to do that. This is a, a, the underside of a tree fern species called Sibodium menziesii. Um, and, I, and I show some of these just to show the differences between the ways the sori, those little capsules where the spores are stored are held. And then here's a microscope picture of what spores look like after they release. We will collect um, leaf uh, bits of leaves that have sori, the, the capsules underneath that are near maturity. And then we'll put them in sheets of paper, fold the paper and let them dry out at which point the spores are released. And this is what they look like. Um, because spores are microscopic, all the work has to be done using a microscope. Uh, we were able to purchase a new microscope recently through a grant that we got through the County of Kauai. And uh, we can uh, better document the process because there's also a camera in this microscope and we can take images uh, of each of the steps uh, of the spores as they develop. So again, this is the technique that we use. These are our phyto trays and there's, there's media in there. It's either a sterile uh, peat moss, uh, cocoa fiber blend, or in some cases, it might be some native soil that we will sterilize and use as, as our primary media to germinate our uh, spores. Uh, once the spores germinate and they look like moss, they develop a little bit and turn into what we call gametophytes. And this, this is what the gametophyte phase looks like. Mind you, these are mic uh, microscope images. So these, these uh, little growing bodies are actually quite tiny. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, both of these images, you will see gametophytes, but you will see the little plantlets beginning to, to develop the sporophytes. Uh, you'll see true leaves beginning to form, uh, especially in the image on the left. So you'll be able to see gametophytes as well as uh, the sporophytes. And uh, that last image was of this species of fern. This is called Kumuniu doryopteris angelica, which is a Kauai endemic. 
and one of the PEP species, meaning that there's only been 50 or less documented individuals in the wild. Uh, this is one of the easier ones to grow. It's kind of encouraging that a fern that's this rare is really quite um, straightforward and easy to grow. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to develop protocols for growing all the different species, especially the rare ones for Kauai and the rest of the islands, so that we can uh, help with their conservation and get them restored back into, the, into their uh, habitat. Uh, in the, uh, our greenhouse uh, at the nursery, we have a section in the back that's called the cool room. There's a swamp cooler fan and the sporophytes, once they're strong enough, are then brought out back there to be hardened off in their natural environment. So mahalo, I appreciate your time. All right, thank you for taking us into the world of ferns, Mike. So now we're going to switch over to Shauna Walsh, our conservation biologist, who's going to be telling you a bit about some progress we've made with Programmia and Cygnus this year. So thank you, Shauna, and go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks for every uh, thanks to everyone tuning in. So for Today, I'll be sharing some collaborative work in applying the zoo community's pedigree based population management approach to improve collection health for the extinct in the wild species, Brighamia and Cygnus. Brighamia and Cygnus is historically endemic to Kauai and Ni'ihau. These photos were taken by Steve Perlman and Ken Wood when it still occurred in the wild, and they risked their lives repelling the steep sea cliffs where it once occurred um, to hand pollinate the plants and collect seeds. And this is why that we have this species still occurring in our gardens and homes today. The Hawaiian names include Alula, Olulu, and Pua'ala. And um, you just heard from um, our first talk from Ben Nyberg, our GIS and drone program coordinator. Um, he and Ken Wood, who was one of the last, or one of the people that last saw the last remaining plant, they conducted drone surveys in 2020 to try to see if that last remaining plant was still there. And sadly, they did not find it. So this is um, where now we consider this species to be extinct in the wild. And so we're applying the zoo community's pedigree-based population management approach to rare plants in botanical garden collections because conservation genetics can help to save species. For many years, zoos have been using stud books or pedigrees, including using genetic data through the use of molecular tools to guide breeding programs for threatened captive animal species that occur within zoos, such as the California condor pictured here. And about 175 critically endangered animal species have stud books documenting their pedigree or relationships to each other. And a handful of botanical gardens, including NTBG, are now bringing this concept to plant conservation. We're adapting these approaches and tools that zoos have been using successfully to conserve animals for plants. And we're using Brighamia and Cygnus as a case study. And results of our work so far suggest that strategic breeding for Brighamia and Cygnus may result in healthier plants for restoration. So I'll share some of what we did and are continuing to do still now. We conducted crosses among different collections by obtaining pollen from plants held at different institutions to end up with progeny uh, that had different levels of genetic diversity and inbreeding. And here's a photo of some of these progeny that I took at Chicago Botanic Garden when I was working with colleagues there on different aspects of this larger project. And what we found in summary is that Progeny with higher genetic diversity and lower inbreeding resulted in more vigorous plants. This isn't too surprising. We know that inbreeding causes problems in animals and other studies have shown that it, inbreeding causes problems in plants. We're just, what's new is we're finally applying this knowledge to how we manage collections of rare plants in botanical gardens. And in this photo, we have a randomly selected plant from each of the cross types we did. And those plants are labeled at the bottom by their botanical garden pollen donor. And they are arranged in order from the most inbred uh, on the far left to the least inbred on the far right. And so plant height was significantly higher in the less inbred progeny. And we found the same pattern for pollen production and pollen viability. We then conducted another set of crosses in 2021 among these progeny to examine fitness in the next generation. 
And we first looked at seed viability in our seed banking lab and then survivorship over time once seedlings were brought down to our, our nursery. And all of the surviving plants after five months were measured before outplanting into two experimental outplanting sites. And this was done in April of this year. Pictured here is our master's student um, from the program in plant biology and conservation at Northwestern University, Jeremy Foster, who was involved in various aspects of the project and came out to assist with the measurements and the outplanting, which turned out to be about 420 plants that we outplanted. And half of them were planted at our Lumahuli Garden on the North Shore. And this is very near to the known historic range of the species. And again, this was in mid-April. And it was really nice. It, it uh, rained just a little bit that day. So that seemed like a good sign. Um, and then the other half were planted at our McBride Garden on the south side of the island at the end of April. Uh, pictured here and we've been monitoring survivorship and growth of the plants at both sites regularly at designated intervals and our six month post outplanting uh, monitoring just took place a few weeks ago and i just got to say that without the tremendous help from so many ntbd staff interns and many volunteers these outplantings especially wouldn't have been possible it was really uh, not only a multi-institutional project but also very much um, NTBG departmental and garden undertaking. So the data is currently being analyzed uh, for the second phase of this larger project involving the experimental outplantings, but based on what we've learned so far, we recommend that institutions which hold collections of rare species consider how diversity is maintained within their collections and conclude that implementing a pedigree-based approach to managing reproduction of plants and collections will slow the loss of genetic diversity and in turn result in healthier collections. And it's our ultimate goal to get these species back into its native, their native habitat. So we hope that successful genetic management in collections will lead to more resilient plants for restoration of not only Brighamian cygnus, but many other plant species. So applying this to other species. And also want to acknowledge briefly my co-authors on the first part of the work I shared. Our, our work was published um, at the end of September and also funding that has supported different aspects of the project from IMLS and National Geographic Society. And mahalo, thank you. Thank you, Shauna. So next we're going to zero in on uh, another specific plant. And this is gonna be presented by Nina. And she's gonna talk to you about uh, Cyania. So go ahead, Nina, you can take it away. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so in 1991, uh, I just need to, a team of botanists led by NTBD senior field botanist Ken Wood helicoptered into the headwaters of this remote towering waterfall 500 meters above sea level in the Mahuli Valley on the northern Kauai. And here they discovered a new species of cyania with elegant narrow leaves and purple flowers, and the new species got the name cyania kuhiheva in Hawaiian. And hardly was it discovered before Hurricane Iniki struck in 1992 and severely impacted all of Kauai and destroying portions of the forest around Limahuli as well. And this was soon followed by an influx of alien invasive species of plants and animals, which led to a struggle and a decline of Cyanea kuhiheva. And the last plant sadly died in 2003. And as the IUCN red list would say, Cyanea kuhiheva appeared to be extinct shortly after it was discovered. However, in 2017, another team of botanists from NTBG and the Nature Conservancy discovered another small group of a few trees in a nearby valley. And this really gave us a new chance to save this species. And Ken and his collaborators have been revisiting this area regularly, installing rat traps, cleaning out weeds, bagging flowers, and collecting seeds as possible. And some of these seeds are stored in the NTBG seed bank, and some were propagated in our nursery. And we also got help from Lion Arboretum Micropropagation Lab. And in 2020, the first four small Cyania cohiva trees were finally planted out in NTBG's Limahuli Preserve 
which is where we are able to keep on monitoring and taking care of them. So by 2021, one of the first out plants was growing really well in the preserve, as you can see here, reaching a height of 35 centimeters. However, as Ken was returning to the white population in 2022, the mother tree, which had by then given us more than 7,000 seeds in itself, had now died off. And while it's really fantastic to get all of these seeds from just one tree, there is really a high risk of inbreeding resulting in weaker new plants that may not be able to reproduce, as Shona was just explaining, for Brecamia and Cygnus. And the other two trees in this new population have not provided any mature seeds yet. So clearly, Cyania cuyaheva is still critically endangered. So in 2022, we had to up our game with our collaborators. So Lion propagated another batch of seeds, as did the NTBG nursery. And soon we had 40 young trees in the nursery, 12 was outplanted in September, and the rest are waiting to go out, hopefully later this year. But really most excitingly this year, again, the team of explorers from NTBG and the nursery, the nursery sorry, <laughs> The Nature Conservancy uh, found another small population of white plants in the same nearby valley, but further away. And I don't know what you think, but I think it's really worth celebrating this with some fireworks. And so the status here at the end of a very successful 2022 is that Cyania cuyheva is still one of the rarest trees with now only four mature known white trees. But the focused work in the last couple of years has really been bringing this species back from the brink of extinction with extensive seed collecting and the help of the lion micropropagation lab and our own nursery. And more than 20 plants have now been outplanted and we have 60 more growing in the nursery at the moment. Um, and we keep them there until they're big enough to survive back out in nature. So this is another really great example of how we work together across departments and with other conservation partners. And again, thanks to all the staff who's been doing the surveys, growing the plants, planting and caring for them in, uh, in the preserve, and to all our collaborators and, of course, our funders, and not least uh, to you for joining us today uh, on this quest for saving Cyanea Kuhiheva. Thank you, Nina. So we have one more presentation for you all, and then we'll transition into our general Q&A session. Uh, this is going to be from Noelle Dickinson, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about what's been going on with our regenerative organic breadfruit agroforest, because uh, we actually just celebrated five years there. So go ahead, Noelle, you can take it away. Thanks, Amanda. So let me pull it up here. Okay. And let me stop sharing. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. So like Amanda mentioned, my name is Noel Dickinson and I'm coordinator for the Breadfruit Institute. Um, and I've been working at the Institute for the last five years. And during that time, we have established uh, re the regenerative organic breadfruit agroforestry demonstration. And it's we're, it's been five years, so we're celebrating. Um, as some of you may know, so what's the point of starting the agroforestry in the first place? As some of you may know here in Hawaii, um, we deal with the same issue that many islands uh, across the globe deal with, and that is that we're food insecure. So most of the food that we eat here in Hawaii is import imported and there is very limited supply um, if something were to happen. So with the goal of encouraging crop diversification of breadfruit growing operations, um, the Regenerative Organic Breadfruit Agroforestry Demonstration was established in 2017. So here pictured, you'll see circled in white, um, those are 31 artocarpus accessions um, that make up the original 1.5 acre breadfruit research or orchard that was planted in 2005. Today, I'll be focusing on um, how the regenerative agroforestry section was established here. So installing the agroforests around uh, established and young breadfruit trees 
provided the opportunity to use several methods to transition from orchard to agroforest. The most challenging aspect of establishing the agroforest was to cultivate the field areas of the regenerative agroforestry section. Um, these pictures show the progression over the first two years during which some of the practices that we used included um, double cutting and pattern mowing uh, to weaken the field grass and um, growing cycle. Then there was tillage and sowing of cover crop cocktails uh, and a dense hedgerow was also planted at the same time. The cover crop cocktails uh, established in succession during year two with the buckwheat flowering first and sun hemp and sunflowers uh, setting blooms last. Uh, this is the same section uh, during year three with a densely planted um, fast growing hedgerow being used as biomass, uh, pruning the cassava pictured on the edge of the field uh, provided space for the slower growing hedgerow plants like tea leaf, kalo, and ko. And then another view of the same regenerative section of the roba. Um, here you'll see images from a different vantage point, as I mentioned, along with leafy materials and more lignified or woody materials. Uh, those two are available and being used as mulch in these pictures that suppress weeds while building the soil. So the frequency during the last five years and, and more recently, the frequency and intensity of mowing and weeding is significantly less. Uh, with an increase in diversity of cultivated plants, there has been a decrease in weed diversity. So less time is spent weeding and mowing of the pathways is now done every two to three weeks versus two to three times per week at the very start of the project. So this is what quickly, what the agroforest, the most recent picture we have, a bird's eye view of last year, um, what the agroforest looks like now. And during the last five years, we've had the opportunity to host several education uh, groups. Uh, a part of the mission of the National Tropical Botanical Garden is to share what we learn and the breadfruit collections both here on Kauai and at Kahanu Garden on Maui serve as living classrooms where community members, students, interns, volunteers, and volunteers are able to get involved in the care and management of the collection, the breadfruit collections. And then the regenerative organic breadfruit agroforest um, has been very abundant. It's also uh, the collections themselves are uniquely in a uniquely indispensable um, resource for our immediate communities here on Kauai and Maui. Here on Kauai, the Roba, in addition to at the robo, in addition to monitoring practices and keeping historical soil sampling uh, records and plant inventory, yield data are also collected. And since establishing the agroforest demo in McBride Garden, a little over 17 tons of fresh produce has been harvested and donated to NTBG staff, as well as local food banks and pantries. Um, which serve Kauai's community. And we've been really honored to be able to have the opportunity to share. Um, mahalo. Thank you so much, Noel. Uh, really great to see what five years progress has been made there. So we're gonna transition to our general Q&A session. So if you have questions for any of our panelists that are on today, please feel free to drop them into the chat or the Q&A and we will ask them. So looking forward to hearing from you. And while we wait for your questions to come in, um, you know, I have a, a question for our panelists. Is there 
As we wrap up 2022, is there anything that you are looking forward to in 2023? I, have, I, I can give something for that. I, so, so since we've had a full-time person, in, uh, you know, Emily in our Fern Lab, uh, there's been a lot of propagation going on uh, of, the, of course, the spores that came out of the herbarium sheets, but then lots of freshly collected spores that have gone into the lab. And so I'm excited to know uh, in the next year um, how many ferns that, it was, that turns into. Um, because, you know, it, documenting the propagation of ferns from spores is a very important thing to learn. But at the end, we want to see how many plants we have as well that can go out to restoration. And uh, we're, we're also growing ferns for uh, Kahanu Garden on Maui, our garden in Hana. And, uh, you know, er everybody's really interested in getting as many ferns back into their sites as possible. So I'm anxious to see just how many ferns, how many different species and the numbers that come out of all of the spores that we've planted in the, in the last year. I can share something, Amanda. Yeah. Thank so you. I just have time to get into all the threats that root cameo and cygnus has faced and that led to its decline, but I'll mention one of the suspected reasons is that its native pollinator has gone extinct and that led to inbreeding in the wild and just, you know, no regeneration, at least to the level that it would have been. And based on the flower shape, color, um, the nectar, the fragrance, it's suspected that it was some sort of hawk moth. And um, interestingly, Kauai has an endemic hawk moth, um, Tinostoma smaragdidis, <laughs> of the fabulous green sphinx moth of Kauai. And actually, in Ben, he showed an illustration of Brighamian cygnus with the suspected possible native moth pollinator, pollinator that fabulous green sphinx. Um, and but nobody's ever seen it visiting Brighamia, it hasn't, that moth hasn't been seen in over 20 years. Um, it's possible that it's extinct in the wild. And we were invited to put in a proposal to explore this more and kind of see if we can solve this mystery of what pollinated Brighamia. So not that we have um, heard that we're gonna get the funding, but we put in a proposal and if it gets funded, it's really exciting next year. Um, what we're planning to do is look at specimens of tinostoma that are held in museum collections, um, primarily at Bishop Museum, and um, collect pollen grains and then use DNA metabarcoding to see if we can identify Brighamia pollen on those moth specimens. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. Um, and Nina, you want to add on to that? Yeah, I definitely want to add on to that because. Um... I should, we should also mention that Shona just actually did manage to get another grant, which is taking uh, two additional species into um, studying, uh, using the genetics to understand the collections. And we're going to try to take it a step further now. Our nursery is also excited in, in getting involved with this and our um, living collections management. So that we will actually not just try it out, but actually use this data to establish uh, or reestablish collection of a couple of other plants, one of them being a hibiscus. So we'll figure out what, how would we best represent the diversity and then actually go out and collect those plants um, in the wild as well and see if we can improve our collections that way. So we constantly strive to take things even further and, and try to improve ourselves each time. And this is necessary because these plants and the risks that are exposing them don't, don't wait for us. Yeah, thanks, Nina, because that's for sure happening, because that funding is secured and that's going to be underway. Um, I see a question in the chat. Would you be looking for a partner that could help bring the moth back? Um, is it still present somewhere in the wild? We don't know. Um, the state etnomology program actually in recent years, like a few years ago, was doing survey work on Kauai for Tinostoma, that moth specifically. So setting up uh, lamps in certain areas where it had been collected in the past and seeing if they could attract moths into the area. But, and I helped, I volunteered with some of those surveys and we didn't see the moth, but um, they were also approached by the same funder to try to do more survey work and see if there's a way, um, if it is there to bring it back. Um, yeah, I hope that answers that. We don't know is the current answer. And then, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Shauna. 
Uh, does anybody else have anything that they would like to share before I ask the next question? And the original question was, anything you're looking forward to in uh, 2023? Yeah, I can uh, I can go on that one. Um, so, you know, we we spent so much time and energy working on developing this new tool. Um, and now we're super excited about sharing it with other people and sort of helping spread this new technology around to other organizations. Uh, we put in a, a funding application to continue development on it and also work more closely with um, organizations around Hawaii uh, with PEP um, on all the islands to, to uh, get people up to speed with this, this new tool that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, so, oh, we did have a, a, another question for you, Shauna, that came in. Um, so kind of like with the Fern Lab looking at um, vouchers, is there anything in the herbarium, any herbarium specimens with flowers that you could see if there are mock scales on them? Yeah, um, we haven't done that. I suppose that's possible. Yeah, um, that's something we could explore. A little bit because I I do know that moss scales you know fly off really easily when the moss like around the plant and maybe they're on like on a stigma because that's usually kind of sticky so yeah it's something we haven't looked at yet though. Thank you. And then we had a question come in through the Q and A from uh, Brittany, and I think Nina maybe partly answered this in the chat, but. Uh, have there been other observations of other native species of moths that could potentially be effective pollinators of Bergamian cygnus? And if so, are there any habitat restoration efforts that could be done to encourage populations of those species to frequent outplanting sites? Yeah, so there hasn't been observations of any other native hawk moths visiting Brighamia, but there are other native hawk moths that occur in the same areas, and they're has been and will continue to be restoration work, specifically even in Limahuli, I think there's been um, habitat restoration work to promote a moth pollinators, actually. Uh, if anyone knows more about that, can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so like planting other species that would be attractive to moths. So those are all options um, and great question. Yeah, but I will say also that I got a video sent to me from somebody's phone like eight years ago on Maui and they sent a video of a non-native hawk moth visiting their Brighamia in Cygnus plant at their house. So that's another, you know, if there's no native hawk moth, maybe there's some non-native ones. And in this case there was, um, it was a pink spotted hawk moth. So that's the only known um, observation that I know of, of a hawk moth visiting Brighamian segments. Thanks again, Shauna, appreciate it. So I just wanted to take another moment to thank everybody for joining us today and celebrating, you know, what we've been able to accomplish in 2022 and, you know, what we're looking forward to do in 2023. So if you are interested in finding ways to support any of this work that you've heard about today, I've just dropped a, a link into the chat to take you to our support page. And we are in the middle of our end of the year appeal right now, uh, which is people need plants. So we hope that you agree uh, that people need plants and we'll be sharing stories throughout the end of the year uh, just as to you know what we think is so special about plants and what we appreciate about them every day. So thank you all again for joining us. I will be sending out this recording to you in the next few days, uh, along with a link to uh, fill out a survey to just let us know what you thought about today's session and help us plan our next series. So, uh, mahalo, everybody. Ahui ho.